What is going on, baseball fans? Jeremy Laracuente here for the Baseball Banter broadcast. And as the title of this video said, we are looking forward to our 2024-2025 offseason wish list for the New York Yankees. There's a lot that is happening with this roster and a lot of things that are going to have to happen if this team is going to try to recapture the magic of 24 in 25 season and try and get back and win the World Series. Not just get back to it, but to win it all. So so we're going to break down my thoughts on what the Yankees need to do this offseason and kind of some different ideas and theories that I have going forward. So we're going to start off with the thing that happened first, kind of the first box to check off, if you will, of the offseason. And that was re-signing Garrett Cole. Cole had an opt out for his contract this season in which he exercised it. And the Yankees could tack on a 10th year to this deal at $36 million and re-up with the ace of the Yankee staff. Now, while that 10th year and $36 million did not necessarily get added, the conversations were well enough that Cole did opt back in to his existing deal with the kind of surface level agreement to the handshake agreement, if you will, to continue trying to negotiate out that 10th season with the Yankees. Obviously, Cole wanted to remain with New York, and New the Yankees wanted to keep him here, rightfully so, given how he's pitched for the Yankees. Obviously, there's a concern with his elbow and a kind of the diminished velocity, but nevertheless, when you look at the pitchers coming available on the market, knowing what you have already in Garrett Cole, in-house, someone who wants to be here, a lifelong Yankee fan, being able to have that already in-house makes it a much easier. So given where the Yankees are in terms of their starting pitchers, and hopefully all of them are healthy, the Yankees would essentially have six starting pitchers with Garrett Cole coming back, having Cole, Rodon, Luis Heal, Clark Schmidt, and then either Marcus Stroman or Nesta Cortez Jr. rounding out that fifth rotation spot. The Yankees seem to be in a good place by bringing Garrett Cole back. Now, beyond that, obviously, there is the big ticket item of Juan Soto and what his deal could potentially be, where he could potentially land. Obviously, we're going to have much more in-depth coverage on Juan Soto in a future video. I will give you my top five landing destinations for the outfield superstar. But in terms of what it means for the New York Yankees, he is priority number one. There's no doubt this team would not have reached the levels of success that they had in the 2024 season without him. They would not have reached the World Series, in my opinion. They might not have even made a postseason spot had it not been for Juan Soto. The combination and the tandem of Soto and Judge really played large for the Yankees all season long. So without a doubt, without Juan Soto, I don't think the Yankees reach the levels that they reached in 2024. So bringing him back is of the utmost priority. Now, we're not going to get into what he could potentially get or where he could potentially land in this video, but we're just going to run under the assumption that the Yankees go all out and bring Juan Soto back. That obviously, again, is priority number one in terms of being able to have a successful run in 2025. So Yankees bring back Juan Soto. That's objective number one. And when you look at the rest of this roster, right, because we have to break down the rest of it, the starting pitching seems to be in a good spot. Bringing back Juan Soto gives the Yankees a, a dynamic one-two punch in the middle of that order with Juan Soto and Aaron Judge. Obviously, we saw the resurgence of John Carlos Stanton in a very, very big way. We have Jazz Chisholm Jr. coming back. Obviously, Anthony Volpe stepped up big in the World Series. It was nice to see. Austin Wells obviously had a little bit of a downturn. I think that that was mostly due to workload increase. I think that given the way the Yankees had used him prior and kind of mixing and matching and platooning him with uh, Jose Trevino early on really did not allow him to kind of keep his legs underneath him. I think going into 2025, he's going to much better understand the workload that is necessary to maintain his ability at a high level for the entire season. So I think that he's going to be in a much better position. Uh, going forward. 
Obviously, the Yankees declined their option with Anthony Rizzo. Uh, they also declined to offer Glaber Torres a qualifying offer, which I think was smart. I do believe that Glaber would have picked that option back up. I don't think that he's going to find himself with a deal in terms of the dollar per year amount that he would have gotten from the qualifying offer. So I think that for Glaber, uh, not offering him that qualifying offer was really a, a smart move by the Yankees because I think he would have taken it. And I also think that that would have put a damper on the potential lineup construction that they're looking for in 2025. Obviously, balance played a huge part in 2024. So being able to really put that into a full-fledged attack in 2025 is going to be of a paramount importance. So I think that when you look at what it now means for the New York Yankees by uh, allowing both Rizzo and Glaber to walk, you now have vacancies in two spots in your infield and potentially trying to figure out which two spots you want to address. Obviously, Jazz picking up third base for the first time in his professional career on the fly. I think he did a very adequate job. I think if the Yankees want to maintain him at third base, giving him a full offseason to prepare at that position, to learn that position and the nuances that it requires, uh, will be a much better improved Jazz Chisholm defensively in 2025. However, I do believe, and I think this was the goal all along, was to move Jazz back to second base. He profiles much better as a second baseman than a third baseman, in my opinion. So I also believe that when they first originally acquired him from the Marlins, the goal was to put him at second base and move Glaber to third. Obviously, Glaber put up a big stink about it, so they moved Jazz there, having never played there professionally in his career. Again, I think Jazz did a very good job there. His athleticism really put was put on display. There's nuances to the position that I think that obviously come with time at the position that you learn, especially given the range and capabilities that Anthony Volpe has. Sometimes you have to let that shortstop take over. Obviously, as a former shortstop myself, I always want to give the lead way to the shortstop. But there are times where that third baseman does need to cut that ball off and get the better angle going towards first base. But Obviously, in terms of his athleticism, Jazz it can play anywhere on the field. We've seen that. The Marlins had him playing center field predominantly uh, through the second half of his tenure with them, uh, a shortstop and second baseman early on. So I think that the Yankees are considering moving him back to second base. I think that's where he profiles best. I think that's where they believe he profiles best, and they're going to move him back there. So you now have vacancies on the corners in the infield at first base and third base. So obviously there's importance to those positions from an offensive perspective, and you're going to need someone that you can rely upon in those spots. Now, I'm going to put an idea out there that I think is the least likely option of what the Yankees are going to do for the 2025 season. When it comes to first base, I think the Yankees should consider employing a strategy similar to that of the Philadelphia Phillies. The Phillies had their $330 million man in Bryce Harper playing right field. And when they acquired the services of Kyle Schwarber and Nicholas Castellanos, obviously Harper was hurt for the first part of that, but he then made the transition over to first base. And I think he made the transition incredibly well. Bryce Harper has translated to the first base position and has worked himself into a quite an above average defender, in my opinion, at that position. Obviously, there's going to be, like I said, about third base nuances that come with learning the position and having time and experience at the spot where you can really get uh, you know, a footing and potentially be a gold glove caliber defender at that spot. I think the Yankees have a player that they can do the same thing with. I think that for the Yankees, moving Aaron Judge to first base, obviously the least likely scenario, but I think they should really consider it. It's not a foreign position to judge as he played it throughout uh, high school and, and part of college. But when you look at what he can be as a potential Yankee first baseman with his size, it's an incredible target to throw to with his wingspan. It's an incredible reach that he has to be able to cut down throws from the Yankee infielders. Think about those bang, bang plays that a six foot seven uh, inch first baseman stretching out with his wingspan, could potentially cut down. It's a, an opportunity for the Yankees, in my opinion, to really consider revamping the way that this roster is built. I think that if the Yankees were to consider moving Aaron Judge to first base, again, 
giving him a full offseason to get acclimated to the position, to learn the nuances, have Travis Chapman, their infield coach, really working with him uh, on a, a very consistent basis throughout the course of the offseason, two, three practices a day, getting the feel for the position really putting the Yankees in a position where having that guy at first base, having that target to throw to, Judge is super athletic. Obviously, we've seen him be able to man center field in the Bronx, which is not an easy thing to do. But moving him to first base gives the Yankees an opportunity to really field out the rest of the roster in a strong way. I think that when you if you the Yankees and you move Aaron Judge to first base, you can then re-sign Alex Verdugo, who they very much liked. Put him in left field. You have Jason Dominguez for center field, Juan Soto in right. You then have Judge at first base, Jazz Chisholm at second base, and Anthony Volpe at short. You already have your established catcher of the future and Austin Wells behind the plate. So now you only have that one spot left open at third base. I think by moving Aaron Judge to first base, you really give the Yankees an opportunity. And I think the Judge is more than capable of handling the position of first base and being able to really adjust and have the nuances not overwhelm him. I think that for the Yankees, the idea of Aaron Judge at first base may sound ludicrous to begin with. It may sound absolutely ridiculous to have a guy who is a gold glove caliber right fielder playing first base. But if you bring back Juan Soto, you do not have right field for him. Moving him to left field, as we saw a couple of times, did not really work out for him well. It just was an awkward fit. And obviously having a full offseason to practice and man left field would make it entirely different. But I think that putting Aaron Judge at first base would actually really elevate the full-scale defense of the New York Yankees. You move Jazz back to second where he's much more suited and more comfortable. You then can bring back Alex Verdugo, which I think is a very underrated thing of what's going to happen for the Yankees. I think that there's going to be a lot of conversation about Juan Soto, and the Yankees are going to quietly bring Alex Verdugo back in. And especially if Soto signs elsewhere, Verdugo's definitely coming back. But if the Yankees move Aaron Judge to first base, they can have all of it. I think Verdugo had a down year trying to prove himself in a walk year in a, in a free agency year, and I think that he's not going to have that same kind of lackluster appearance if he comes back to the Bronx in 2025. So with the Yankees, there's an opportunity here that if you move Judge to first, you can really cement the entire roster in a much stronger fashion. Again, by doing that, you allow the Yankees to be able to bring back Verdugo, who's a left-handed bat. It allows you to have Jason Dominguez, who's a switch hitter in center field, and Juan Soto in right. I think that that gives the Yankees and the lineup an absolute, incredibly balanced roster. One of the things that really plagued the Yankees throughout the, the late uh, 20, uh, 20, 2017 all the way through the 2023 season was they were so predominantly right-handed. Opposing managers had easy lanes in terms of being able to get their players out. What made the 2024 team so much harder to navigate for opposing managers was the fact that there was so much balance in the lineup. You have Jazz Chisholm coming back. Austin Wells, again, another left-handed batter. Jason Dominguez is a switch hitter. If you bring back Juan Soto and you bring back Alex Verdugo, that's two more lefties in the lineup. That then leaves you only with Stanton, Judge, and Volpe as your right-handed batters. Obviously, there's a spot at third base, and I'll get to that in a minute. But the idea of moving Aaron Judge to first base may sound absolutely ridiculous, but if you really think about it, that could really potentially put the Yankees at their best offensively and defensively. Now, when it comes to the idea that the Yankees are going to move Aaron Judge to first base, Highly unlikely. So what are the realistic options for the Yankees at first base? When you look at the free agent market at the first base position, it is predominantly all right-handed. The top arm, the top batters at the first at the first base position this offseason, Christian Walker, Pete Alonzo, both are right-handed batters, and it makes for a much more difficult opportunity for the Yankees in terms of being able to have that balance in the lineup. It starts to go back closer to the 2017, 2019, 2021 teams than it is for the season that we're, we just witnessed. The problem with that becomes is that 
the Yankees getting back to that kind of that lane, right, where opposing managers can have that dominant right-handed arm come out of the bullpen, strike three guys out, and call it a day. We don't want to get back to that. So, in my opinion, as good as a glove as Christian Walker has proven himself to be, I want to avoid him. As much of a power threat as Pete Alonso is, I want to avoid him if I'm the New York Yankees. There's really only one name that is available on the free agent side of things that even remotely intrigues me at first base. And it is the oldest guy on the board for that position, and that's Carlos Santana. Santana is a switch hitter, and while he's not the same guy that he was early on in his career, this is still a guy who's capable of putting together an incredible at-bat. He works counts, which is very fitting for the Yankee M.O., He's a switch hitter, so it allows you that balance once again in that lineup. And if you want a guy who has been a consistent gold glove caliber defender at first base, there's none better, in my opinion, that is available right now on the market than Carlos Santana. The other option the Yankees can pursue is a trade, in my opinion, with the San Francisco Giants for Lamont Wade Jr., Lamont is a left-handed batter that provides the Yankees versatility, being able to play first base, but also in the outfield. And we know the Yankees like that versatility. So if the Yankees are going to approach the trade market, that is a potential name to be paying attention to. Now, San Francisco is in a position where they also are trying to tool up. I think they're one of the teams that could potentially be very deep in the Juan Soto sweepstakes. So the likelihood that they would be able to broker a deal in which the Giants get, uh, in which the Yankees get Lamont Wade Jr. from the Giants is very unlikely, in my opinion. So that's why being able to sign on a guy like Carlos Santana on a one-year deal, uh, maybe with an option for a second year, something of that nature, could potentially be a good fit for the Yankees. Now, obviously, the downfall to that is is that he's 39 years old; he'll be 40 years old. And do you really want a 40-year-old first baseman? in the Bronx. Obviously, if he gets off to a slow start, similar to what happened with Jose Abreu and the Houston Astros, now it's going to be looking like a very terrible move. Again, as crazy as it sounds, as outlandish as it may seem, I think the best option for the Yankees is to try to move Aaron Judge to first base. And that really, to me, solidifies the rest of the team. When it comes to third base, there's one real option that is a third baseman, and that's Alex Bregman. Obviously, that's going to sound blasphemous. This is a guy who is synonymous with the 2017 Astro sign-stealing scandal, but it's long past us. They've won a legitimate World Series in 2022, and while Bregman isn't necessarily the same guy that he was when he first got called up to the Astros, during that season, during the the next couple of seasons after, this is still a guy who puts up productive at bats. This is a guy who is likely going to be able to produce 20, 25 home runs for you with very little emphasis on home runs. Obviously, this was a down year for Alex Bregman, and I think that could play into the Yankees' favor if they want to approach Bregman as their everyday third baseman. The other arm, the other potential hitter that I would like the Yankees to approach. And obviously, it would be moving from uh, the shortstop position to third base would be Willie Adamas. I think it's going to be much harder to make a move for Willie Adamas, especially given the amount of money that I think it's going to take to re-sign Juan Soto. I don't think the Yankees are really going to want to go into that market. Because I think for Willie Adamas, the Dodgers are going to come calling. They're going to want to solidify their shortstop spot, which was their only potential source of weakness. Uh, going into the World Series or going into the postseason. Obviously, Tommy Edmond really solidified it for them uh, as the series went on when uh, Miguel Rojas got hurt. But when you look at what Willie Adams could be for the Yankees, yes, he's going to be a guy who's going to hit for a lower average, but he's going to provide a significant level of pop. It also is a guy that provides you with very good defense. So, yes, moving from short to third base could potentially cause a little bit of an issue, especially given the ability that he has at shortstop. But given the time, he's already been a member of the uh, American League East prior when he was with the Tampa Bay Rays. So giving him that opportunity to have the offseason to transition to third base, I think could be a fit for the Yankees. 
Uh, it's a guy who is uh, younger than Bregman, who's been a better player over the past couple of seasons. But those are potential options in terms of the Yankees' third base situation. For me, I would like to get Bregman. And for me, the reason I'd want to get Bregman, one, I don't think that it's going to be as much money as it would be to try to get Willie Adamas to go to third base. The second reason is I think that the Yankees, the the way that they had their team feeling in 2024, the fun, the kind of the flamboyance, the arrogance, the, the cockiness that they played with throughout much of the season, especially what they'll have with Juan Soto and Jazz Chisholm and, and potentially Alex Verdugo coming back for a full season – it's going to be a team that has that air about them. And Bregman, to me, is a guy that, that also fits that mold. I think that he's a guy that is going to have a chip on his shoulder for how he played this year, and he's going to want to come out and address the haters. And I think that for Bregman, putting on the pinstripes, being able to go out there and be the bad guy of baseball is going to be something that he's going to relish. So I think that his ability to man third base – in a pinch, he can play shortstop if you needed. Um, I also think that the way that he carries himself is going to be something that allows this team to really get back to being the bad guys of baseball. And I think that that's when we're at our best as the Yankees. I think that that's when they really put themselves in a position to be successful. Now, whether or not the Yankees are going to want to give the money that is going to be associated with Alex Bregman, that we'll have to wait and see. When it comes to kind of a more, quote-unquote, bargain option, a guy like Gio Urshela could be a guy the Yankees look to. I don't think that that's really a good fit any longer. Uh, as much as I do love Gio Urshela and what he brought to the Yankees when he was here, I don't think that he's the same guy anymore. His defense has regressed, in my opinion, and his offense really only sparked that one time with the New York Yankees. So I think for the Yankees, if they're going to give an opportunity to anyone, uh, they potentially could keep Jazz at third base, have Oswald uh, Peraza come in and play second base every day or have him play third base every day. There, to me, is an opportunity to give maybe some younger guys at bats at that third base spot. Obviously, you want someone that is going to be consistently in your lineup. I think that's the biggest thing for New York is that over the last several years, they've spent a lot of time kind of mixing and matching and not really giving guys the opportunity to get every day at bat. When you look at what Oswald Peraza has been able to do in the minor leagues for the Yankees with consistent every single day at bats, he's been a tremendous hitter at AAA. Give him that opportunity in the Bronx day in and day out, the same way you did with Anthony Volpe in that first season. His rookie season, he was told, you're the shortstop, you can tune out the noise, you're the guy, we're not taking you out. That's going to be the kind of emphasis that has to be given if you're going to give a young guy like Oswald Peraza the everyday job, whether it's second base or third base. Now, that being said, if the Yankees want to keep Jazz Chisholm at third base, give him the full offseason to man the position, learn the nuances, and get themselves into that spot, Second base has potentially some more intriguing opportunities in the free agent market. You could go with a guy like Hassan Kim. Now, obviously, there's an option there. The Padres are likely going to try to exercise that mutual option, but it's really going to become dependent on him whether or not he wants to maintain that. I think that he likely would. But if he opts out and there's a potential for a conversation there. I really do like what he is capable of bringing to the Yankees. The other option I think that is very interesting for the Yankees is a, a guy in Jorge Polanco. Yes, Polanco is not going to be the greatest defender, but he's going to provide consistent at-bats, and he's going to be able to provide some pop. So it's another guy that you could potentially look at as an interesting fit for the Yankees at second base. There's also an opportunity that the second baseman for the Los Angeles Angels, Luis Ranjifo, is set to be a free agent after next season. So it's a potential that he's one of the guys the Angels could be looking to move as to not have to pay him for his services long term. So that's a guy that the Yankees potentially could target as a trade candidate. The other thing that I think the Yankees could potentially investigate is 
a deal with Jerks and Profar. We know Profar has been predominantly the left fielder in his time with the Padres, but we know that he's capable of playing all over the field. Being able to bring in a guy like Jerks and Profar, a switch hitter who could provide some pop, especially at the bottom half of the Yankee lineup, even though he was hitting predominantly third for the Padres last season, this could be a guy who could really help lengthen the Yankees lineup even more. It's a guy that can provide that depth and that versatility, being able to play all over the field and be able to spell guys on their days off, whether it's they're taking the full day off or a half day at the DH spot. This is a guy that can be plugged in to multiple locations. So that's a guy that potentially could be a, a fit. The other guy that I think is an interesting candidate had a very down year. There's no doubt about it. But Geeka Hernandez is a very interesting candidate to me. Last offseason, we found out that uh, it was between the Dodgers and the Yankees where he was going to end up with. And I think he goes back to the Dodgers this year, too. But there's a potential fit there, in my opinion. Again, the versatility that he provides, being able to play second, third, short, any of the outfield spots, it's a guy who provides versatility, and the Yankees love that. So I think that there's an opportunity that he could potentially be a fit for the New York Yankees, more in a potential platoon or bench role as opposed to the starting job. But nevertheless, it's an opportunity there. To me, the Yankees also have to really, really, really address the bench. The fact that Jose Trevino was the guy that got the call to pinch hit in game two really showed the lack of depth that this roster had. It showed the shallow construction of this roster. For the Yankees to be able to have a, a tremendous and deep postseason run, they have to have those guys on the bench that are going to be able to come in and provide consistency obviously being a bench player a pinch hitter is a difficult difficult role but you have to have those guys that are going to be able to be on the bench to be able to be called up at a moment's notice and provide your team with some serious value one way or another whether it's a pinch runner whether it's defense whether it's that versatility being able to play all over the field whether it's a guy who's going to be able to come in and give you a pesky at bat or a guy who's going to be able to be, come in and give you that power hit that you're looking for in that crucial spot of a game the yankees bench and their lack of depth on that bench really showed itself in, in a large way in the world series and to me, the Yankees have to address that. They have to get better on their bench to be able to really put themselves in a position to be successful uh, in terms of winning the World Series. No matter what is said, it goes back for this organization to winning the World Series. The boss said it. The captain said what are it. Your awards and accomplishments, though, which is the one that's most special? We'll go down there. When we win, that's it. Is it that plain and simple for you, though? Yeah, I mean, that's why you play. Is it winning or misery for you? Yeah. What's misery like for you? It's tough. You play to win you know, in anything. You want to race me down the street, I'm going to beat you. <laughs> because it's, that, it's black and white for me. You know, I don't think you're happy finishing second or happy getting to a World Series. The goal is to win. Um, if I don't win, then it's not fun to be around. So what's worse, um, 2007? or 2001, 2003, you get to the World Series, but you lose, or not even making it to the World Series? I mean, how do you rate losing? You know it's all I mean? misery to you. Yeah, I just, I don't, I've never understood it. You know, well, it, felt, it feels better because we made it to the World Series and lost. Why does it feel better? <laughs> I, I, I've never understood that. I really don't get that one. Well, there is something, I, you know, you've, you've accomplished something by at least getting to the World what Series. What did you accomplish? You lost. <laughs> <laughs> but there was, some, there was some winning to get there. Yeah. Jeter was very clear losing is losing there's no qualifications of getting to the World Series and still losing you still lost it's all about winning championships for the Yankees to get back to that mindset they have to have a better bench think about the teams of the dynasty and the the guys the level of players in my opinion there were Hall of Fame caliber players on the Yankees bench during those dynastic runs in the late 90s Yankees have to get back to having those bench players that could be starters on other teams. Yes, it's going to take the funds. It's going to take a financial commitment to have those guys on the bench. But you have to have those winning players. Think back to 2009. Eric Hinsky, a winning player, was on the Yankee bench. Jerry Harrison Jr. was a winning player. He did the little things. Getting a bunt down. Hitting and running. Being able to, to go first to third. 
playing that versatility defensively, having those guys on the bench provides you and makes you a winning type team. The Yankees need to get back to that type of behavior. Then the last thing is the bullpen. Obviously, we spoke about the starting rotation early on, and I think the Yankees are in a good position there with the six starters that they have. And I think that the bullpen is a, an area where the Yankees tend to do very well. Brian Cashman and his team tend to find those guys that are going to be able to fit the the Matt Blake school of pitching, and they find that value in them. A couple of guys, a few guys, are, are coming off the books in terms of that bullpen. And I think the Yankees need to re-up with three of them. Those three guys are Jonathan Loisaga. Obviously, we did not hear much about Loisaga after he got hurt. He's now a free agent. I think the Yankees need to re-engage and bring him back into the fold. The second guy who I think is extremely important to what the Yankees are, are going to need in 2025 and beyond is Tim Hill. Tim Hill got brought over. It looked like a, a scrap heap pickup. But he turned out to be an incredible reliever for the Yankees and get some very, very big outs for them. I think bringing him back is not going to cost them a whole lot, and I think that it's a move that can truly benefit them long-term in 2025. The other guy is going to be the most controversial one in terms of bringing him back. But it's with the caveat that he is working middle relief innings, not a closer, and that's Clay Holmes. Clay Holmes is a guy who... I have been very down on as the closer, and it's based on his stuff. Not that Cole ha Clay Holmes has bad stuff, because he doesn't. He has a dynamic sinker that needs more work, and when he has too much time in between, it moves too much, and he can't control it. Having Clay Holmes as a middle relief guy, we saw how good it could be at its best. Obviously, it's going to come with that caveat that he is not the closer. He is not sniffing the ninth inning at all. He is a setup man and a middle relief role. If he can handle that job, if he can handle that and that role, then we can bring him back. Obviously, the financials have to line up because I don't want to pay an arm and a leg for his services because there's a dime a dozen in terms of what he is capable of doing, in my opinion. A lot of guys with a lot of good sinkers. Are they as, as nasty as his when he is on? Not necessarily, but we can replace what he gives the Yankees in terms of a ground ball pitcher. But at the right deal, I think Clay Holmes in a middle relief role could be a valuable asset for the Yankees to bring back. There's one other arm that I want the Yankees to target, and that is Tanner Scott. Again, I don't want him as my closer. To me, that is Luke Weaver, but... If the Yankees can sign Tanner Scott to be that guy, to be that lefty, to get out those big-time lefties, the Jordan Alvarez's, the Shohei Otani types, that to me is a guy who can truly help this Yankee bullpen in a very big way. I think that for the Yankees, it's an opportunity for them to be able to have that guy that you know you can go to to get those big outs. You pair him with a guy like Tim Hill, and you can really put this team and really shorten the game, in my opinion. Then we're going to close out. There's three relievers I think the Yankees could target. All three are, to me, on the trading block. They're potentially available. And while the names are going to sound completely, utterly uh, unrealistic, potentially, as trade targets, I think the Yankees have the ability to get it done, especially given where the teams are in terms of their window. We're going to start with Devin Williams and the Milwaukee Brewers. Milwaukee is in a position where being a smaller financial market, they're not really going to have the funds to be able to pay Devin Williams the kind of money that it's going to cost him for them to be able to keep him as their long-term closer. Yes, he is coming off of uh, an injury that kept him out for most of the 2024 season, but he came back and he showed good stuff. And I think that for the Yankees, it is a player that they can acquire to be that guy to pair with Luke Weaver at the back end of games. 
So for me, going into it, I also think the Yankees are one of the few teams that could potentially extend a guy like Devin Williams long term uh, as long as he shows the ability to be able to get out in the Bronx. So when you look at what he does with that airbender, that dynamic changeup, I think the Yankees have a real fit for that in their bullpen. The second guy that I want to bring up is Ryan Helsley from the St. Louis Cardinals. The Cardinals, to me, are a team that is going to be heading into a rebuild. Uh, they let Paul Goldschmidt go. There's a lot of uh, talk and rumors of Nolan Arenado potentially being available, which I would not mind seeing Nolan in the Bronx. I love the way he plays defense, and I think that Nolan is a guy who really could revitalize his career uh, the down, last couple of down seasons that he's had with the Cardinals, I think he could refine some magic in that bat in the Bronx. But that's just me being biased because I love the way he plays defense at third base. But getting back to Helsley, this is a guy to me who potentially, again, pairing with Luke Weaver at the back end of that bullpen, could really provide the Yankees a dynamic one-two punch at the end of games and really be able to shorten games. It's a guy who you can have in that ninth inning role, you can have in that eighth inning role, or whatever the matchup might bring. I think for the Yankees, they, in 2025, are going to employ a much more full-scale bullpen attack role when it comes to those days where the bullpen is necessary. And lastly, the name that I think the Yankees should really try and acquire is that of Mason Miller from the No Place to Call Home Athletics. And when you look at what Miller can do, this arm is absolutely filthy. Seeing what he did to the Yankees in the Bronx when the A's were here uh, in 2024 was just mind-boggling to see that ball move the way that it did. And I think that for the Yankees... The A's are going nowhere. They have no home to call home. So keeping a guy like Mason Miller just seems ridiculous in terms of what they're going to be able to do. They're not going to have any real place to call home, so there's going to be no fan base to come out and support the team. So moving on a guy like that and getting assets at a lower level that could be there for whenever they potentially make Las Vegas in a few years, is is to me the right move for the Oakland for the A's. So it gives the Yankees an opportunity to go get a, another certified back end of the bullpen kind of arm. To me, if the Yankees make these moves, bring back Juan Soto, you sign Tanner Scott, you re-sign Loisaga and Tim Hill, potentially Clay Holmes, you trade for one of the three in, in Devin Williams, Ryan Helsley or Mason Miller, you really solidify your starting pitching. You already have that built back in with Garrett Cole coming back. You then solidify your bullpen. With bringing back Soto, you solidify the top half of your lineup. I think that for the Yankees, finding themselves in a position where they can get real consistency out of their lineup. Again, to me, moving Judge to first base is the absolute most under-the-radar move to solidify this team. And if you can make a deal with the Cardinals for Nolan Arenado and Ryan Helsley, let's go for it. Because I'm not mad at having Nolan in the Bronx, right? Or you bring in a guy like Alex Bregman, you give an opportunity to one of the young guys, you keep Jazz at third, you give Peraza the start at second base. I think the Yankees have a lot of ability with this team. There's a lot of moving parts right now. Obviously, it all comes down to what happens with Juan Soto? That is priority number one. And we're going to get into, in a future video, what I believe are the top five landing places for Juan Soto. But for me, the Yankees, the priority number one is bringing Juan Soto back to the Bronx. That makes everything else fit for this team. If there is no Soto, then you need to find yourself a first baseman too. So it's going to be a lot of work this offseason for Brian Cashman and his team to fix all of the woes of 2024 to be able to help us erase the the brutal memories of Game 5 of the 2024 World Series. But it can be done. If the Yankees go through with this bullpen plan, with this blueprint plan that I've laid out, bringing back the guys that I want to bring back, signing the guys that we need to and making a couple of key trades, the Yankees could truly put themselves in a position where they could win the World Series in 2025 and not be the team that beat themselves in the 2024 World Season. So 
uh, World Series. So definitely let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Let me know what you're thinking as far as the Yankees' plans. What happens if the Yankees don't sign Juan Soto? Let me know all of those thoughts. What would your lineup look like given the players that I've named in this video? Let me know all that down in the comments. Make sure you follow me on social media at on uh, X at banter underscore baseball. You can find me everywhere else at baseball banter broadcast. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel as most of our content and our viewers is not viewed by subscribers. So definitely hit that subscribe button. Let all your baseball friends know this is the channel to watch in 2025 and beyond. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. And I will catch you on the next one. Peace.